I'm talking about, as believers, God has given us an operating system. That operating system basically comes from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians has two parts. The first three chapters of Ephesians. Have you studied Ephesians yet? The first three chapters of Ephesians are all about our position, that we are in the heavenly places in Christ, forgiven, eternally forgiven. The second half of Ephesians, starting in chapter 4, is all about the practical holiness, look at this, that's, that comes through the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So basically, in the New Testament, we are called new creations in Christ. In fact, that's what your, your little uh, t-shirt or uh, sweatshirt, ID brand new, that's what it's talking about. How does that happen? Well, my phone right here, without the software, is dead. It doesn't do anything. It's just like it sits there. The only thing that makes it work and respond is the operating system, the software. Uh, this has iOS, you know, the Macintosh software. If you have an Android, are those many here? Are Androids many here? Galaxy and Samsung? Is that the reason? Samsung? Uh, so you understand what I mean? So what does God's operating system look like? Well, basically, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, God wants to work in our lives. Look at chapter 5 of Ephesians for just a moment. I want to show you something that it's basically applying what Hebrews says about the power of the Word of God. And Hebrews 5 starts out by telling us in verse 18, someone read Ephesians 5, 18. Ephesians 5, 18. Aksan, Aksan. Is it Anna or Anna? Like sitting on a chair. Okay. Oksana <laughs> sitting on a chair. Would you read 518? <laughs> <laughs> and do not get drunk with wine, for that is the wrong truth, but be full of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what does it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit? How many of you this morning know that you're full of the Holy Spirit right now? Hold your hand up. Okay. I see three. You're part of the street pub. Well, I gotcha. <laughs> what does that mean? Did you know that's how we're supposed to always be? Would you like a telephone that when you poke the button, nothing happens? What would you do with it? You'd throw it away, or take it back, or take someone else's, or something, you know? We want it to work. Did you know we're supposed to be operating full of the Holy Spirit? When we're full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, number one, our marriages are changed as the reflections of God's love. Uh, number two, the fullness of the Holy Spirit overflows into our families. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, a family becomes a reflection of Christ's peace. Our work, that's in Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. Our work is changed. Did you know it doesn't matter what you do for a living? You can be a waiter at a restaurant. You can be a factory worker. You can be the president of the company. All God wants is for us to do our job full of the Holy Spirit, and it transforms everything about our lives. I think that I shared the gospel more often when I wasn't a pastor than when I became one. Because when I was not a pastor, everybody I met was unsaved, and I worked with them, and every one of them knew I was different than them. They all said, you're so different. You didn't get drunk over the weekend? You don't count how many girls, you know, that, that you have triumphed over? You're not living for the party? So what's wrong with you? Are you dying of cancer? You know, are you sick? What's wrong with you? Okay? Fullness of the Holy Spirit is all about applying the Word of God. Now, I started this with you earlier, talking about, remember we, after we did the angels, I said that we need to have the armor, you need to have a sword and all that. Basically, everything in the Bible is driven and empowered by our operating system. And our operating system is called being full of the Holy Spirit. And so what God wants is, he wants us to operate correctly. If, if I push the button and nothing happens on my computer, it's not operating correctly. How many of you drive cars? Hold your hand up. Okay. When you get in a car, or your parents get in the car, they take the key, they put it in 
they turn it, or if it's a new car, you just push the button. What do you expect to happen when you either turn the key or push the button? You expect the engine to start. That's called operating correctly. If it doesn't do that, you take the car to the dealership, to the mechanic. You take it to Sam. No. Are you a car man? So there. Hmm? So Okay. No, not mechanic. Not mechanic. You were a sales. Software. Software. He's on a program. There. So you go to Samuel and say, it's not working. Okay. <laughs> now, think about this. We are supposed to be operating the way God designed us to operate. This is what the Bible says. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Christian life only works when we are operating the way God designed us to operate. How did God design us to operate? Well, the evidence of obeying God's operating system is right here. When we're operating full of the Holy Spirit, this is what shows up in our life. Love, joy, peace. Where is that from? Galatians 5.22. You all know that, right? You all know that verse? But the fruit of the Spirit is, is 5.22 and 23. You all know that? Say yes. yes. That's one of the most important verses in the Bible to see whether we're operating the way we were designed to operate. What does that mean? Well, when operating as we were designed to operate, we are refilled every day with self-sacrifice and love. If I am filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm walking toward the door, and someone cuts in front of me, I back away instead of keeping going, trying to get in front of them. The world, you push and get your way. You want to get, you claim everything for yourself. You take the best spot. You take the best food. You take the best everything. When you're shopping, if there's something, you grab it because you want it for yourself. But full of the Holy Spirit, we're filled with self-sacrificing love. That's what he wants from us. Secondly, we are recharged every day with endless joy. What is joy? In the Bible, is it this? <laughs> oh, if joy is a reflection of the word. But what is the biblical word joy? It's when we get detached from our circumstances. Watch. This is me. These are my circumstances. My mom has cancer. I'm sad. I win the lottery. I'm rich. I'm happy. I get a C minus on a quiz. I'm sad. Um, I meet a new girlfriend. I'm happy. My girlfriend doesn't like me. I'm sad. What do you see there? The person is attached to their circumstances. <laughs> I get a new car. I'm happy. I get a flat tire. I'm sad. You know what I mean? I get a new iPhone. I drop it and the screen breaks. We go like this. What is joy when you detach from your circumstances? When God, see, I am recharged every day with endless joy. My joy does not depend on my circumstances. That I didn't get the top bunk, you know? That I didn't get the good parking place. That I didn't get the new whatever. That I don't have the newest whatever. Joy is when I'm detached from my circumstances. And people see that. Because all the people floating down the world are totally attached to their circumstances. <laughs> they have a good job, they feel good. They have a bad job, they feel bad. They have a good boyfriend or girlfriend, they feel good. They have lots of money, they feel good. They don't have money, they feel bad. God says, joy is from the Holy Spirit, not from your circumstances. That's what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit. He all of a sudden detaches me from my circumstances. Here's the third one. We can go through the entire days with a spiritual battery life that allows us to operate with unstoppable peace. I have peace all day long. And Bonnie, Bonnie and I, when we were first married, we went up, we moved to California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And, uh, and we lived 
two hours from where we were. It was only 20 miles, but it took two hours. Only in Los Angeles, right? And we would sit on the freeway with 12 lanes of traffic, all sitting still. And they would be edging forward like this, kind of like China is right now. And so we had to leave at 5 o'clock for work at 8 o'clock. And we would get downtown at 7 o'clock. And we would go to the same place every day for breakfast, every single day. I drove by to work. We parked, went to breakfast at 7 a.m. And, of course, we had our little Bible with us. And we'd eat breakfast. And we had our Bible out. And we were reading to each other and talking. And every day for three months, we ate in the same restaurant every morning for three months. After about six weeks, there was a waiter wearing a little black cap like you just heard. Only he was a cocaine addict. Cocaine is a drug. And you take, you know, you take a little piece of paper, roll it up, and you snort it up your nose. White powder. And it makes you feel high. Well, after it makes you feel high, you know what it does? It's a very strong chemical. And it, it destroys the blood vessels in your nose. And so your nose gradually gets bigger and bigger. It's amazing to see a coat like that. Their noses, their nostrils are about this big. They look just like a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros or something. Their noses are this big, and they're red, and they run all the time. So Mr. Runny Nose, and they're also a little sick because they're ruining their body. So Mr. Cokehead was our waiter every day. And I didn't even really notice him. It was a busy restaurant, and we were eating away, reading our Bible. And finally one day, as we were reading the Bible and eating, I noticed that he went like this. And he, he was trying to look in my eyes. And he said, I have a question for you. I said, what's the question? He said, I'm a cocaine addict. I said, I can tell. He said, what are you and your wife? He said, you are high every morning. He said, I have served you for three weeks, and you're high on drugs every morning. He said, I can only be high with cocaine for a short time. He said, I have to take it, and I'm high, and then it goes away. He said, you're high every day. What was he talking about? He was talking about, we can go through entire days with a spiritual battery life that allows us to operate with unstoppable peace, endless joy, self-sacrificing love, unflappable long-suffering attitudes, evident kindness, even to our enemies. What does God say? Love your enemies. Love in the Bible is not a feeling. It doesn't mean all of a sudden I have to look at every ISIS person and say, oh, you just make me feel so good when I see you. What I can do is say, I will sacrifice for you. I will show Christ's love to you. I will share his gospel. I will not be hateful and, and angry at you. I will have evident kindness even enemies reflecting God's goodness in an evil world with faithfulness and gentleness all wrapped up in this amazing self-control. And by the way, that coke head, listen to us. Share the gospel with him. Not for another reason that he could see the joy and peace of Christ. How do you get that? Being full of the Holy Spirit. That's what God offers us. Uh, we are supposed to be filled with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. <clears throat> That's what God wants. What, what is that? If you take away all those descriptors, it's just the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's our operating system. Now let me ask you this morning. When people look at you, do they see those things growing in your life? How do you grow them in your life? Is it, is it like the cabbage out here that you got to, you know, hoe around it? And, and how do you make the fruit of the Spirit grow? That's so granular. By feeding your soul. Every day, you get to choose what's more important. What do you go for first in your life? What's the first thing? When you wake up and, and start your day, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about saying, Lord, I want to feed your spirit growing in me. I want you to bear fruit. I want the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit to grow in my life. Basically, 
The scriptures tell us our spiritual armor is our care and protection system. The only way we can keep the fruit of the Spirit growing is to allow the whole armor of God to make us withstand all of the evil around us. And that is through us seeing that we have to take the helmet of salvation. And by the way, we're going to cover that a little later when we get to chapter 10. We're going to look at the doctrines of salvation and what that helmet means, how we're supposed to know what God did. And we're supposed to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, real quickly, let me get to this, you guys. Boom. Boom. Um, for just a second, I want to show you something here. Because uh, the um, this isn't in your notes, but this is going to introduce when we get also to chapter 10, and I want to get this slide up for you. What's the largest form of Christianity in the world right now called? Catholic Church. Um, do they have Catholics in Korea? Yes. A lot of them are not urban. A lot. How about Taiwan? Are Catholics there? You ever heard of Roman Catholics in Taiwan? That church? Are they in Japan? Yes, no. There are. Oh, yeah, your sister goes to a Catholic school, doesn't she? So they're in Korea. Do we have any in California? <laughs> a lot of them. This is the biggest form of Christianity in the world. Have you ever wondered where it came from? Have you guys had church history yet? <laughs> Real quickly, for you all, we're going to, in chapter 10, briefly, we're going to see what is the Catholic Church? When did the Roman Catholic Church begin? What's the history of the Roman part, which is called Romanism? And by the way, what was the Reformation about? This is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation this year. It was on October 31st of 1517 that the Reformation took place. Now, this is a drawing. Basically, um, I tell people that uh, you can describe the history of the church with a little box. And I draw this box for them. I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, basically, we have the early church that started here, and then we ended up with the Roman Catholic Church. Then it was so bad, we got the Reformation. And then we have uh, basically modern missions and evangelicalism and everything you see today. And basically, we've evolved to, this would be where um, we're headed right now, and this box is the Bible. And the early church, every part of it that was biblical was here, but even in the early church, there were errors. Uh, the early church had, that's what Galatians is about, that's what First Corinthians is about, that's what Paul's correcting. And so the early church grew into what we would call the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholicism has much truth in it. It's biblical, but it also has a lot of awful stuff like the mass and all those idols or images and Mary and priests and all that stuff. So that's why we came to what's called the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, all that stuff. And so the Roman Catholic Church started in the 4th century, the early church started in the 1st century, the Reformation was in the 16th century. Modern missions started in basically the 18th century. And here we are today. What happened to the Reformation? Well, a lot of the Reformation is biblical. But a lot of it wasn't. Luther never got rid of infant baptism. He never got rid of a lot of stuff that he allowed to stay in the church. And so by the time we get to the modern time, we have all the denominations. Basically, this is where uh, the Baptists came from, the Methodists, if you've ever heard of them, uh, the Presbyterians come from here, um, the uh, Anglicans. And then, time went on to today, and now we have this whole charismatic, uh, charismatic church. And all I'm saying is this, and you can look up at the uh, drawing here, 
I'll give you a better view of it. Um, there is, there are parts of the Roman Catholic Church that are absolutely wrong, like the work salvation. But any part of Roman Catholicism that's in the Bible is true. There's part of the Reformation that's biblical. It's from God's Word. And there's parts of it that aren't, like infant baptism and covenant theology and everything else. Today's evangelical church, much of it's true, but there's also a lot that goes on in every church that is called traditions. It's not in the Bible. It's just the way they do it. Um, then, in the charismatic renewal from you know the mid-20th century on, we have much that's true, but there's also a lot of the charismatic church that's, I mean, like Benny Hinn, none of what he does is in the Bible. Uh, all of this excessive stuff that the charismatics do is not biblical. So what we're supposed to do is measure everything by what does the Bible say. Even in the conflict between Augustinianism and Arminianism, both of them are found in the Bible. And there's a portion of Calvinism that's true. And there's a portion of Arminianism that's true. And that's basically the, the key to understanding church history. And we'll come back to that um, later. Now, let me get up here to... Here we go. How many minutes do we have? Oh, good. We have enough time to finish this. Um, let me get back. It's got to be on the first one. Uh, you should have this in your notes. What page is that, Paul? You're always my guru. 19. 19. Guru Paul. Uh, 18. Guru Paul. This lesson is based on Hebrews 5. Look in your Bibles at Hebrews 5. This probably is the one I want to emphasize most with you. So all of you that can't stay awake, it's time to pinch yourself. Because for the next 26 minutes, I really want you to get this. Okay? Now watch. Hebrews 5, in verses 11 to 14, talk about us as disciples that were called to personally, every day, follow Christ. When Jesus called his disciples, when you guys get to the Holy Land in six or seven weeks, you're going to be at Capernaum, you're going to probably be at Bethsaida, you're going to be all around the Sea of Galilee, right? Is that part? Have you heard where you're going yet? Well, I'm sure you're going because it's the heart, but it's the best part. How did Jesus call his disciples? He used two words. Anybody know what two words he used? Yeah, say it louder. Follow me. Boy, is that simple. Follow me. You know what that says? Salvation is a relationship with a person. Salvation is a person. I meet a lot of people and I say, are you a Christian? They say, well, I was baptized. I go, uh-huh. But are you a Christian? Well, I joined the church. I go, hmm. Or they'll say, I pray a prayer. Did you know that? I'm not sure yet whether they know what they're talking about. Even if they joined the church, got baptized, and prayed a prayer. The, the question is this. Are you following a person you know named Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Is he real? Are you following him today? Does he talk to you through his word? Do you hear his voice? Do you know him? My sheep, John 10 says, hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, chapter 5 of Hebrews talks about it. And, and what we're in, this is our fifth class, by the way, we're, we're supposed to be exercised, that's Hebrews 5, and anchored, I just talked to you about that, you know, the rope around the soul. Okay, what does this look like? Oh, there's that yellow part again. That's what's going to be on the test. Okay, if I say, heroes of the faith, what chapter do you say? If I say the name of Christ, what chapter is that in? Look. One. Yeah, it's in chapter 1. If I talk about the perfect priesthood, what section of Hebrews is that in? Yeah. If I talk about how we're supposed to live, that's 13. See, the perfect life Christ gives to us, our relation to others, and ourselves, and to God. Heroes of the faith. And then what about that looking on to Jesus thing? Yeah, that's in chapter 12. So you're going to, and every class I'm going to remind you this, but you're going to see this. Okay, chapter 8 
in your Bibles, I, I don't want to miss every class I'm going through some of the key verses. Look at chapter 8, verse 1 of Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the perfect high priest because, and you should underline in your Bible, we have an high priest who is seated at the right hand of God. In America, there's a lot of kerfuffle right now because we have a new president and who he's allowing to be around him is a big problem to a lot of people. He's allowing um, a different type of people to advise him. And they're sitting at his right hand, so they're influential, like his daughter, like her husband in America. I don't know how much you're keeping up on this, but it's just driving people crazy in America. All the students at um, schools in California yeah, are, are rioting and everything, because they don't like who is seated at the right hand of Trump, his advisors. Well, here's the lesson of chapter 1. We have a high priest seated at the right hand of the majesty of high. Jesus is exactly right there talking to God on our behalf. Now keep going down in chapter 8, look what it says in verse 5. It says, it's talking about the Old Testament tabernacle, and it says, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Now look at verse 5. Some of you might never have noticed this. Moses was divinely instructed as he was about to make the tabernacle, for he, that's God, said, see that you make all the things according to the pattern shown you in the mountain. Did you realize when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, God showed him a model of the tabernacle that he copied for the earthly tabernacle? Do you realize the tabernacle we see in Exodus is patterned after one that's in heaven. Did you know that? It's fascinating to think. That's why we spent so much time. I kept showing you all those drawings and everything. That was not something designed by Moses. God designed every part of that. And it says it right there in verse 5. Uh, now, here's, here's uh, this is going to be important because this is going to be one of your quiz questions, okay? Uh, tomorrow. Okay, everybody wake up. Uh, can some of you bump those people that are asleep next to you? because I don't want them to miss this. this. This is probably what helps me the most as a Christian when I struggle. It's chapter 8, Hebrews 8, and verse 9. Can someone read Hebrews 8, 9 for us? Okay, you know, I see you have it. 8, 9. Hebrews 8, 9. Okay. Uh, not to work, come and into bed, I may leave their father out. And the women I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I should no concern for them, Israel. Okay. What well, you not just read, thank you for reading that. God led them or took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. What were they in Egypt? So Egypt is the place of slavery. And God wanted them free. Now, most of us, if we're not careful, the sins we struggle with can enslave us. There are people that are enslaved to eating. They're, they're, they're called gluttons. They can't stop eating. There are people that are enslaved to games. They can't stop eating. They're addicted to games. My friend with the big nose, what was he addicted to? Drugs. He was in slavery to drugs. We can get enslaved by it. You can get enslaved by fear. You can get enslaved by pride. You can get enslaved by pornography. You can get enslaved by alcohol. God's way out is always the same. Do not dress. How did God get him out of Egypt? What does it say? What did he do? Read it again. Uh, in the whole verse? Yeah, the beginning of it, especially. No, I like, come in that I may be get fathers. On the day when I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So how did he bring them out? He took them by what? Okay, now watch. Here's Enoch. He's in Egypt. Stick your hand up. If I go like this long enough, what am I going to do? I'm going to pull him out of where he is. Now I want you to think what God said. 
How did God get Israel out of Egypt? What does he say in verse 9? He, he led them or took them by the hand and pulled them up. Now, now look what this says. I want you to see why I wrote this out of board for you. Took by the hand, led out of Egypt. God wants to take my hand and lead me out of slavery to any sin. There is no sin you're struggling with. That if you go like this, help me, God. Help me. I don't want, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be enslaved. I don't want to be lustful. I don't want to be proud. Help me. God will never turn us away. He'll always take our hand and lead us out. So number one, from Hebrews 8, 9, what's the first thing God wants to do? Read it out loud. Everybody use your English and read one word at a time, the, the, starting right there. Let's read it. God wants to take my hand and lead me out of slavery to sin. And I hope you believe that. For the rest of your life, when you find yourself doing something that you know displeases God, this is what you have to do. When my kids would get stuck and realize they were stuck, either they were stuck in the mud or they tumbled it over in their bicycle and were all tangled up, they always, when they were little, reached out to me toward the bottom. What they were saying is, I can't do this. I need help. God wants to help us every day. He's leaning over, saying, Joy, put your hand up. You know, like, like if you're drowning and the rescue boat comes up, what do they say? Grab this, reach out. That's the Christian life. Number one. Number two, come on, stay away, you guys. Look at verse 10. Now, Enoch did such a good job of nine. Someone read verse 10 of chapter 8 for us. Hey, Cynthia, I see you zeroing in on it. Read it for us. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel as he lived days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be his gosh, and they shall be my people. Whoa! You guys are memorizing verses. You guys are studying old T survey. You are trafficking in truth all the time. It will only get to here unless you understand this verse. You guys can go through Word of Life Bible Institute and get a straight A and not be different. Then you go right back to uh, Korea, California, Alaska, Australia, where is it? Virginia, Alaska, Pennsylvania, China. You can go to Taiwan and be the same person if you don't do this. Look what God says. God wants to put his word in my mind. He put his laws in their minds. God wants to put his word. He wants to write it. What did you, Cynthia, read that again? What does it say? <laughs> yeah, any part, the good part. I will, <laughs> I will put my law in their mind and walk them on their hearts. Write them on their hearts. God, he doesn't just want you to know this stuff. You know, it's on your paper and you get an A on it. He wants it written on your heart, right here, where it's a part of your life. That's what God wants to do. That's why you're here. By the way, sometimes you guys are wondering, what am I doing here? This is so hard. You know, uh, it's just hard living so close together. And you might not like the food all the time. You might not like something. What am I doing here? I'll tell you one thing. God wants to teach you he's going to take your hand and lead you out of slavery to any sin. The more you hold his hand, the less sin will have a hold on you. Number two, he wants to write your work, his word on your mind. And number three, so I'm going to read verse 12. This is something else God wants to do. Who wants to read verse 12? Okay, Nate. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. God wants us to know he will never remember our sins. Can you remember your sins? All of us have things we are sure ashamed of in our life. God says, I'm not going to remember those anymore. So that is vital. Okay? Next thing in chapter 9, uh, 
Remember our intro to this? This has probably got the, the verse that most changed my life in chapter 9. Um, let's see, it's in verse 14. Verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works so that you can what? What does verse 14 say that God wants to do? Cleanse us so we can what? Serve. You guys are here because this is preparation to serve God. Here's a danger. Uh, look, look at the danger. You can't serve God if you're not cleansed. Uh, you can serve God, but it doesn't count. He doesn't empower it. He doesn't bless it. There's a danger here of an uncleansed life. You can't serve the Lord without being clean. It's like uh, before you work in the kitchen, if you're helping with the food, you have to wash your hands and put on those gloves, right? See, that's, you, you and I, we have to beware of not being cleansed because that inhibits our service. So chapter 9 is about that. Um, and then uh, uh, he appeared, verse 25, I love this. Uh, he, he purified us, verse 24. He appears in the presence of God for us. Christ is the purifying, chain-breaking, condemnation-ending work on the cross. He appeared once. He put away our sins. He was offered once. That's the essence of salvation. And we're, we'll, we'll run over this in chapter 10. Okay, let's do uh, chapter 5, and then it's going to be time to go. We only have 12 minutes. And you can do whatever it takes to stay away for the next 12 minutes. Um, after you receive salvation by God's grace, this is in your notes, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. Your growth in Christ and fitness to help others biblically is in proportion to how faithful you are to examine yourself and apply God's truth. Every day, we don't read the Bible just to get it over with. We read it to see what it says. We're supposed to be exhorting others. We're supposed to be uh, avoiding. We're supposed to be closer attention. We don't want to drift. And we've got to apply. See, James, the first New Testament epistle says, don't just hear the word of God. Be what? Doers. What is a doer? Applying God's truth to our life. Okay? Come on. Wake up, computer. Sorry. I have to get this out of it. Scriptures on personal sanctification. Matthew 7 says we're supposed to check ourselves for personal sins. Remember the Lord says, uh, don't judge others, judge yourself, look for the law in your own eye. Romans 12 says the disciple surrenders. 1 Corinthians 11 says a disciple says no to personal sins. Uh, I still sin, but I do it unwillingly. I don't like it, I hate it, I say no to sin, I fall into sin, but I, I reach out to Christ. Uh, Galatians 6 says, our attitude is that we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, um, and also, boy, there we go. Hebrews 5, we need to exercise, that's what we're on right now, personal exercise, and we're regularly seeking cleansing, that's if we confess, we're walking in the light, we confess our sins. So basically, this is a description of what personal sanctification looks like. Checking for personal sins, surrendering every day, saying no to sin, having a, this humble attitude, uh, uh, personally exercising, and seeking regular cleansing. Okay? Now, what's the pattern that we're supposed to have in our life? Um, come on. Here you go. Uh, we're to be rooted and established in the Lord. Not conform to the world. That's what Romans uh, says. Uh, secondly, we're supposed to practice God's word. See, that we keep coming back to this Hebrews 5 passage I want to show you. We have to practice God's word. And, and I'd like to uh, take a little while to show you that. Now, basically, every time I write here, um, showing you, I'm following the same pattern. I show you a scripture. I summarize something from it, and then I give you lessons. So a summary, lessons, and then I show you how to apply it. That's the way, that's kind of the simplest way to study the Bible. 
So basically, what's the summary of Romans 12, 1 and 2? Romans 12, 1 and 2 follows chapters 1 through 11. It's there for a reason. That's the summary. I can decide to do what it says in verse 1, present. That's an heiress tense in Greek. It means I say, Lord, I surrender. And then I go back and remember that I presented myself. I still remember when I went forward, uh, and probably many of you, have you gone forward? Do they still do that? Where you kind of go forward at the end of the service, or you go forward to the campfire? Do they still do that word of life? Have any of you ever done that? Cynthia's done that. Have any of you ever done it, gone forward, and surrendered, and, and Nate's done that? The rest of you, have you ever surrendered? Yeah, Paul's done that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've always remember that. On the chair. Uh, <laughs> you know what we're supposed to do? Once and for all, present ourselves, and then keep reminding ourselves of that. And I still remember at camp when I went forward. I was holding on so hard to the chair in front of me that I think I almost broke my fingers. And finally, I said, I'm not going to fight the Lord anymore. It was at Camp Barakel, honey, and it was at a winter retreat. And I went forward. On the, I always go back and remember going forward. That's what Romans 12 is about. Then I have to die daily. I'm supposed to be a living sacrifice. And I renew uh, this once and for all decision all day long. Uh, I want to stay tied to the altar. And my life matters to God. Romans 12, 1 says we're supposed to be holy and acceptable. So all this basically is the backdrop for what Hebrews is getting us to. Um, we choose to not be conformed to the world. That's paddling upstream. We, we want to be transformed. That means that, that uh, uh, see, the word is morphed or metamorpho. And it means God is transforming. He's, he's changing my, my life by his spirit through the word. And God proves. See, uh, what's interesting, Romans 12 says that God proves uh, by working in us. Uh, he, he shows me that he's real when I surrender to him. And, and I think for you all, at, at your, your beginning of Christian life, you need proof of God and the greatest proof is Him changing your life. And that's why you need someone close to you that says, Nate, hey, you are different. John, you're different. You're changing. You, you know, Rebecca, you used to be this way and you're not anymore. See, that's, that's the benefit of being around believers. Even here in the dorms, young people, should, you should see each other changing. And that's what the Lord wants. Okay. Basically, how does that apply? And this is what I'm closing with, and I have six minutes to do it, okay? How does that apply to our passage right here? How do we apply? Number one, God has revealed our calling in life. In Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, he says, I want you to grow up. Remember, he says, don't be babies anymore. I want you to get strong. He says, you need to be strong. And I want you to, instead of needing someone to help you as a baby, you're supposed to be teaching others. See, look at what Hebrews 5 says. I, I, I say it, but you should see it there. It says in verse 12, you ought to be teachers. That's the goal. We're all supposed to be teaching others. But instead, you need someone to teach you. You're in need of milk, verse 13. You're a baby, verse 13 ends with. But solid food belongs to those that are exercised, they're grown up, they're full eight. What does that mean? Well, understanding the symptoms. How do you know if you're spiritually immature? There are four ways. Number one, God's word is dull. Here's your first test. You guys can do it today. If you have the choice between watching a YouTube clip that you're dying to see of some latest music video or reading the book of Micah, or Obadiah, and you go, oh man, I'd rather watch the YouTube clip. That is a, the clearest indication. When God's word is dull to me, when I don't feel drawn to personal Bible study, corporate teaching, Sunday services, or you know your small group, discipleship group, the evidence of salvation is hunger, the word. 
So number one, if God's word is dull, that's a bad sign. Number two, if sharing the word with others is nothing I'm interested in learning about, look what verse 12 says. For by this time, you ought to be teachers. Did you know you should practice explaining the Bible to each other? You ought to ask Rebecca, tell me what you learned in your devotions this morning. You ought to say, enjoy it. What did God teach you today? You, you ought to be doing it to each other. Because that's what we're called to do. We are supposed to all be able to express truths from God's word to each other. That's what the church is about. The whole church is supposed to be doing this. Do people do that at your church? Do normal people walk up to you at church and say, let me tell you what I got out of the Bible? How many of you normally have that happen? And what, do you have a house church or something? Normal churches. Are you kidding? Paul, does that happen every Sunday in California? Someone just walks right up to you and says, man, I can't wait to share everybody got out of the word with you. Have you ever had anybody say that? Rare. And you remember. It's not normal. Why? Most people are not healthy spiritually. Most people have the symptom. They are not interested. That's not something they're interested in. Here's another one. Here's another symptom. My spiritual digestion system is sick. I'm on baby food only diet. How would you like it if, if you couldn't eat anything in the dining hall? You had to just drink baby food. Meta, what do they call it? Not, what is the baby food stuff? Um, Similac, they call it in America. Similac. It's milk for sick babies. Most believers are sick. They can't take the Bible. They can't read the Bible. They can't find stuff out of it. They couldn't share something out of it. And Hebrews 5 says that the, the way to solve that is this. You, you've got to exercise. And, and what's, what a symptom of not wanting to do this is you put anything into your mouth. You're just like a baby. Have you ever seen a baby? They will drop their pacifier on the floor, and they'll pick it up off the dirty floor go. It's filthy. Have you ever cringed to see a baby sticking something off the floor in their mouth? And you think, oh, man, what was on the floor? It got germs. Yet, as believers, we'll stick anything into our mouth. Just like babies have no discernment of what's dirty, dangerous, or poisonous. Spiritually immature people watch, read, and listen without any discernment or discretion. They are confused, unstable, and driven about by every way of new and different false teaching that comes along. It's because they don't abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. They just have no discernment. They stick it all in their mouth. Okay. How do you get over this? Well, this is, now I'm showing you what I wrote in, in my journal when I studied this. Lord, I want to be a disciple maker, biblical counselor. God has shown me my calling in life. God's goal is verse 12. I want to become a disciple-making teacher. I want to fulfill what the Bible says. That's the first application I got out of this passage. I said, Lord, if it says in verse 12 that we ought to be teachers, I want to be a teacher. Now let me ask you, have you does verse 12 say we ought to be teachers? Yes or no? Look down. Is it yes or no? Look down at verse 12. What does it say? You ought to be a teacher. Okay, yes or no? Does God want us to be a teacher? Yes. Does God want you to be a teacher? Yes. I don't mean a word of life teacher. I mean a teacher of the truth. How do we become that? We say, God, I want to be. Lord, I want to be what you call me to be. Number two. I want to, verse 13. I want to discipline myself for godliness. 